It says we're live. So this may not work through the same. Oh, it says it's going live in two and a half minutes. So it may not go through the same thing. Let's see here. You might have to reshare it. Can't hear you. We'll give it a couple minutes. Okay. Oh, I see it on your page. All right, I'll be back in a second. Cool. So guys, we're gonna give it a few minutes for everybody to trickle in and um, play some music. We'll be back in a second. Just catching up, making sure we got all the logistics and technology stuff out of the way. So guys, we're gonna give it a few minutes for everybody to trickle in. Oh, we're done with that. Logistics and technology stuff out there. I'm gonna hide for a second. So guys, we're gonna have a few minutes for everybody to take a look. We'll be done with that. We're here, just waiting for people to trickle in. Well, technically, uh, we're just at the time, so we've got a couple minutes. Everybody who's here so far, can you guys just confirm that uh, you can all hear us? Um, and <laughs> uh, you can hear both Kevin and I, and that there's no issues. Hey, guys, how's it going? Hopefully you can all hear us. <laughs> Kevin, you can hear me, right? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Loud and clear. Excellent. I am trying to read through all the comments. Hey guys, how's it going? <laughs> Locked out in Michigan. What's up? Um, if you guys haven't already, make sure you're sharing this with people. This is good information. I've already had a lot of people who have told me. Uh, the things that we've said and the things we've talked about aren't out there. So if you feel like you know somebody that could be affected by coronavirus, which is everyone, then you should share it and let them know that we're doing this. Uh, this is a new platform we're using too. So I'm just going to see uh, if I type something just as long as you guys can see it so we can answer your questions as we're going through. <laughs> Does that show up to everybody or just us? Quarantine in New Jersey. <laughs> Mark, Mark, are you able to uh, type stuff back? Are um, you able to type? I actually, yeah, because I, I have the Facebook right. page open so I can reply to people. Oh, you do? <clears throat> We're a little bit on a delay. So people recognize where there's a little bit of delay because of the, the app we're using, but um, it's there. <clears throat> okay. Um, it doesn't <clears throat> how many people are on, but you're ready to go? Yeah, I think, uh, do you want to give it? I guess we got time. We can do it. How many people are on right now? Um, 
Can't tell you. Okay. All right. That's fine. I'm ready to begin. Are you ready to begin? Let's get it done. Let's do the thing. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, hello. Uh, good evening again to everybody. Um, I hope you guys can hear us okay. Um, is everyone still freaking out or are you all just kind of bored at this point? Tired of Netflix? Well, come and watch us. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Kamel. I am a practicing emergency physician outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. And for those who do know me, hello. Um, I also have my colleague here, Dr. Weisman, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, Dr. Mark Weisman. So I have the pleasure, uh, the privilege, and the uh, pain of being friends with Kevin Kamel, Dr. Kevin Kamel here during residency where we met. So we both trained in Philadelphia. Um, I've been practicing as a locum's emergency medicine physician. Um, I've worked so far in California, Missouri, and Arizona. I've um, been doing it for a while, had a little bit of training before that, but that's neither here nor there. Um, again, friends who know me, uh, welcome. I love you all. And anybody that's new, hi. Um, I'm sorry that you have to know Kevin. It's, it is what it is. I can't help it, but uh, that's how we go. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. Um, so um, there should be a live chat. Uh, again, we're using a new platform, so we're trying to stream both of us together so you guys can ask both of us questions. And uh, we think that two brains is definitely better than one. Um, so if you have anything, we can definitely see your comments. I might not be able to type back, but we'll definitely get back to you and try and answer those as they come up. Um, I want to focus again, too, like I said on our my first live stream, at least. So we are both emergency physicians. We focus on emergency care and situations and critical resuscitation. We see everything. So we see strokes. We see heart attacks. We see urinary tract infections. We see your sore throats. Um, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 that's coming out, this is just our latest thing that we're seeing all over the ERs around the world. Um, and it's become you know, a pandemic at this point. Uh, we know that this information is changing, um, if not by the day, by the hour. So we are here to try and keep you guys up to date with the latest information, the latest studies, and give you the best knowledge that we have as of today, March 22nd. I want to emphasize, um, me and Dr. Weisman, we are not your pediatrician. We are definitely not your gynecologist. We are not surgeons. Um, there is a lot we don't know. Um, and we try and give you, again, the best knowledge that we have, but in no way is this any type of medical advice. Um, if you have questions that are specific to uh, what you're dealing with, we want you to talk to your physicians, your primary doctors who know you best. This information we're giving you tonight is not associated with the CDC, any of our hospitals or anyone else. So if we give you an opinion or if you ask for our opinions, it will be ours alone. Thank you again to my lawyers. <laughs> so um, I did want to thank everyone too that saw the last episode. Um, I think it it's over 10,000 views right now. That's awesome. Getting this information out there is what we want. Um, so I know there were a ton of questions um, and a lot tend to go towards your daily life. Um, you know, what you guys are seeing, what you guys can do and why we're asking you to do some of these things that seem a little ridiculous. Um, so we'll get into that now. Um, and Dr. Weissman, if you want to start us out, we're going to be talking about the difference between social distancing and quarantine. So I did want to, I'm going to do a little bit more of the legal thing because I have to, I've been told. So um, I have to have to, we also have to put a disclaimer out there, right? So um, all of our opinions that we said are our own. We don't represent any specific organization or hospital. If something we say disagrees with them, go with them. Um, this is our opinions. This is us being fun, trying to communicate with uh, the people we care about and trying to get people informed. So um, that's what it is. So. Uh, talking about quarantine, we're talking about uh, social distancing and what does it mean? So let's kind of get into that. So it's a good question. A lot of information and a lot of different things has been going around the media about maintaining your distancing and when to uh, be quarantined and when not. So the most important thing to know and the way I would essentially break it down is that if you're not symptomatic, um, but you are a human with hands and feet and a mouth, then at this point, you probably should be practicing social distancing. So what that means right now is that what we know from the disease is that if you cough or sneeze or as you're breathing, you can project the virus out about six feet, right? 
And a lot of people end up being completely asymptomatic and not knowing that they have it. So that's why they've put a lot of these measures in place in an attempt to try to decrease the uh, transmission of that disease. Um, here in LA, you can see in, in New York, things are kind of shut down. That's for that reason. So that's an everybody kind of approach, right? Um, if you have a little bit, if you're concerned, if you've been around somebody who might have coronavirus, that applies to you. So that's essentially good hand washing, cover your mouth when you cough. If you do cough, wash those hands and then still trying to maintain about a six foot distance away from people. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, quarantining is a bit different, right? So quarantining is the full on no contact, can't touch people, can't uh, be around anybody. So this has changed a little bit over the last, Kevin's laughing at me and I don't mind. Uh, uh, right now, I'm on quarantine. What? Oh. I'm on quarantine right now. I haven't left my oh. apartment on day nine, so. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna get, pass this over to him of what's, what's going on with quarantine, but basically what that means is you can go out, you can be in your yard, you can be around your family, right? So, um, especially if there's people, uh, if you have somebody with that you think has coronavirus and you're all in a family together, honestly, frankly, you probably all have it. Um, if you're afraid of transmitting it between, you know, people and things at uh, home, it's okay, but you don't have to go totally crazy. It's not like you never touch anybody. Um, be careful about that. Um, but that's what we're doing with that. Kevin, did you want to talk about more about specifically quarantine? Sure. Um, so again, um, social distancing is something everyone should practice, right? So you maintain six feet away. That's at grocery stores. If you decide to go out in public, you know, if you want to go for like a run, just keep your distance. Um, quarantining is totally different. So I am currently on a quarantine um, because I'm considered more of a high risk individual for exposures because I work directly in the ERs with people. We don't know what you guys come in with. Um, and again, one of the biggest things is uh, symptoms. So a lot of this information we're trying to give you is to put in uh, terms for people who aren't physicians, who aren't nurses. This is for the general public, what we're doing right now. So my concerns are typically you should practice social distancing, like Dr. Weissman said. But when you start getting fever, when you get a cough, and we know those are the two most common symptoms, 80 to 85, almost 90 percent of people will have those symptoms. When you're developing those symptoms, you can have runny nose, you can have muscle aches, you can have a sore throat. Once you become symptomatic and you're concerned that you may have had an exposure or you know, you're concerned you may have the coronavirus, because a lot of people right now are getting it and we don't even know the exact numbers. If you think you have it, then you go on quarantine. Now what quarantine is, as he alluded to, this is kind of like a total lockdown mode. So I haven't left my apartment. I haven't set foot outside my door. I had one of my friends drop eggs off and then I opened the door after they left and didn't breathe when I opened it. I mean, it's, it's serious. Um, the problem is again, spreading it to people when you have symptoms. So we know all these common symptoms you can have. You can have some very nondescript things like GI symptoms. So you can have some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, nondescript abdominal pain with it too. But mostly since it's a respiratory virus, it's going to be upper respiratory symptoms. You can have some cough, things like that. So um, the CDC has very specific guidelines on this. And for most of the people listening, I think this is what's going to apply to you. The question is whether or not you should get tested. Um, this is a debate. Uh, we are still having debates about this, um, whether or not you should get tested. I will tell you, as my own personal opinion, if you have minimal symptoms and you don't work in healthcare and you're not traveling all over the place, um, most of the time you're considered a lower risk individual. I don't really think testing is great. Um, and Mark will talk about this more too. Um, if you get a test while you have symptoms, it's got a 70% accuracy on it. That means three out of 10 people potentially could test negative and actually have coronavirus and spread that to people. That's an issue. So. I am more of the CDC guideline of if you're considered mm -hmm. someone who has minimal symptoms, but you do have a fever, you got some muscle aches, you don't need to go into the hospital, but you don't know if you have it. Their recommendation is a seven plus three strategy. So the idea is that from the time you start having symptoms, and I'm going to give you some like examples. So say you start getting symptoms on Wednesday, 
if you develop symptoms Wednesday, you need to wait a full, so the seven plus three is you wait seven days to see if you still have symptoms. If you are symptom free after a full week, and it's been three days up to that week where you haven't had symptoms, where you're not taking Tylenol, you're not taking NyQuil or DayQuil, then it is typically safe to go back to social distancing. It doesn't mean you can just go, you know, lick all of the, you know, handrails at your local grocery store. Please don't do that. Um, you still need to maintain social distancing. So if it's been, say you get symptoms on Wednesday, next Wednesday comes around, you still have a fever, you still have a cough, you're not ready to go back. Your quarantine still needs to continue. So you need to continue that until you get to a point that you're symptom free and then wait another three days. So let's say it's Friday, like nine days afterwards, and now you don't have symptoms, you need to wait an additional three days before you can start going back out to like the grocery stores, public areas, if you have friends, family that can help you get some things in the meantime, make a TikTok video, whatever you do just to keep yourself sane, but quarantine yourself, those are the most important things that we're seeing. Um, I wanna give a brief, uh, just think for those who are in the healthcare field, we are a totally different population, so I will keep it very brief. We have a one plus 24 hour strategy. So if you're working in like a hospital, like we both work in the ER, you are allowed to work if you're asymptomatic, but you know everyone's wearing PPE now, or they should be. Um, if you develop symptoms, what the CDC recommends is you get a test on day one when the symptoms start, and you need a repeat test at 24 hours that's negative. If both of those are negative, you can return typically when you don't have a fever, um, or you know your hospital has certain policies. Um, but you have to have two negative tests. If it comes back positive, you got the Rona, I'm sorry, quarantine yourself and then wait the full isolation time, all right? Um, so that is most of the things I want to hit on. And um, Mark, if you wanna you know, talk about some of these tests that we're developing too. Got that Rona, if only it was an actual Corona, <laughs> not coronavirus. So unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of data as far as what's going on with the testing in the United States. As I'm sure most people are aware, um, we've been having a little bit of a, a limited access to testing. This, in my experience, where I've seen does vary um, state to state and region to region. There are places that are offering drive through testing. Um, but in my understanding, most of those do require a doctor's note or um, some kind of um, evidence that you need to have it done. So that's something to keep in mind. We are at this point rationing out the tests for those people that we feel critically need them or are at higher risk. We do in the medical field have a tiered um, response that's been recommended to us. So um, keep in mind, a lot of people have expressed to me frustration that they've gone to the hospital and haven't been able to get testing and that's true. Unfortunately, um, that's uh, been something we've been dealing with on the front lines as well is we really wanna be able to test people, but we haven't had the opportunity. Now, the other thing as Dr. Kamel alluded to is that um, part of the problem with the test right now is that it only has a 70% sensitivity. That means three out of 10 people that have the disease will essentially test negative and will come back as having not having the disease and go on and live their merry life. So that becomes a problem. Um, we're kind of used to this in the medical field, right? Honestly, the flu swab mm -hmm. that everybody speaks to and everyone you know praises is um, at best 80% sensitive and at worst 50% flip a coin may or may not know. So it's not totally out of the realm of something that we deal with. We kind of uh, kind of expect that, but you have to understand if you're having symptoms, um, if there are things that are similar and you test negative, you could still have it. So it's important to be mindful. That's kind of why we talk about routine or um, repeat testing at times we need it or people that are more high risk. Um, I unfortunately, I looked, I haven't seen anything about um, availability of testing increasing in um, the future, um, you know, knock down and start, you know, banging on the your administrators, leaders, um, senators, trying to get that stuff mobilized. That's all I've heard about it. But unfortunately, that's kind of tight lipped. Uh, I did see, you know, I looked through the article on CNN. They are talking about a new rapid test, which they think could be available in 45 minutes to four hours. That is the test that was available in Singapore, which allowed them to have a pretty significant and rapid response to their coronavirus outbreak. I think something like that would be wildly beneficial. I think um, 
uh, Dr. Falsi. He's the leading epidemiolo epidemiologist, can't speak, uh, and Trump's advisor. Um, and he is working to that. He says the same thing, that we want to be able to test basically everybody, um, but it's not available. But it's coming down the pipeline, and hopefully um, we will have some updates on that in the future. It's just not there right now. Yeah. Um, one, uh, just quick aside to, um, some, I got a lot of questions from, uh, a lot of women who are concerned, you know, if they have newborns, um, and they're breastfeeding, you know, should they go get tested? Um, and, uh, one thing that we're seeing is again, this issue with, you know, like, we don't really know, um, if you test negative, if it's a true negative, um, because a lot of times we just don't know. Um, but one thing that came up was this idea, you know, like, can we test everybody? I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I mean, we just don't have anything. I think in the next at least week to two weeks, I can personally see, yeah. I don't know how you feel about that. Um, but one thing was, is it okay to breastfeed? Um, and I was uh, looking actually on the CDC website. Um, uh, breastfeeding, by the way, is, uh, extremely important. Um, if you can breastfeed and you don't have any reasons why you can't, and there's very few, um, we've seen that it gives uh, a lot of vitamins. It actually infers some of those antibodies, um, through breast milk itself, which is very important for uh, newborn development. Um, so, uh, they were looking to see, because we don't have any data yet on breastfeeding, particularly for COVID-19. Um, they looked uh, for influenza and uh, they looked at some other viral you know, illnesses we've seen. Um, and as long as, you know, uh, the mom is like wearing a mask, um, there's good hand hygiene washing. Um, I haven't seen any issue and they actually recommend as long as you're following precautions, there shouldn't be any issue. Um, if you want to get tested, um, I think pregnant women in some sense are more of like a special population. Um, and I would be but just know if you go to some of these testing centers, they do everything to separate you and social distance you when you come. Um, but you do run a risk of being in public around people that want to get tested, that you could get it. That's not to defer anyone. That's just telling you, you know, what the reality is. Um, so if you're sneezing and coughing and all these things, I mean, just again, try and cover it up as much as possible. We'll get into some of the data too about newborns and infants, you know, what their symptoms are like and what the risks are. Um, but just for those who have been asking that question. I'll throw a quick caveat in there and then say that um, pregnancy as we know it is a risk factor basically for everything, sorry, um, but it does increase the risk of any kind of respiratory illness. Interestingly, I saw a while ago there was a study that they looked at the newborns um, for women around it in Wuhan, and they found that most women that um, had any kind of the, uh, form of the virus and were able to clear it, right, that immunity ends up being passed on to the newborn. And that's why the newborns tended to have a certain level of protection actually um, for up to six months. So as Dr. Kamel alluded to, both in the breast milk and by uh, being in the placenta, that immunity, those antibodies that your body itself produces get transferred down to the, the newborn and end up prefer, um, conferring a pretty significant amount of immunity. So that actually is a bit protective. Yeah. Um, we're going to go on to the next question that was asked of me that keeps coming up. I do want to answer a quick one that showed up in the comments. Uh, someone who uh, did test HIV positive but is otherwise healthy, they have an undetectable level. They want to know, are they considered a higher risk? Um, in my medical opinion, if you are on uh, combined heart therapy, you're compliant with it. You don't miss doses. You don't have any other medical problems. We've shown that if you're compliant with your medications and the, the thing we look at, and you know if you have HIV, we always ask you what your CD4 count is. That gives us an idea of how well your normal immune function is working. If your level is typically uh, higher, um, so like once, once you get up to a certain level, we don't even really care anymore, then you have a normal functioning immune system. So if you know your CD4 count is above, and I forgot the exact number, it's like a thousand or something, I, I forgot what it was. But as long as it's at a normal level, it shouldn't infer any additional risk to you. You should function as a normal person. We don't think of you as any different. My concern is that person who doesn't take their medications, who has more of like AIDS compl uh, complications, so they have end stage things that they're coming in with, those are high risk individuals. But if you take your meds, you don't have any other issues, I would actually consider you more of like a low risk, not no risk, but much, much lower risk. Um, one question, uh, I love this question. So there was a, an article that came out, uh, asking, 
you know, it shows that COVID's killed um, with a lot of heat. You know, can I just heat up my body or can I go into a sauna? Um, this is one of my favorite questions. Um, so that gets into this idea, well, you know, if, if you give anything enough heat, it's just gonna kill it, right? Um, but the problem is that's true for you as well, all right? Um, so we don't know everything about this, but there was a, and I wanna get this right. So there were some interesting studies that looked um, when they drew uh, levels from your blood and they would uh, take it and they could see like the virus. And what they would do is they would heat it up um, to 56 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. And if you're me, an American, I have to Google what 56 Celsius was. Uh, that is 132 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you know anything about human biology, uh, we as emergency physicians are terrified if your core temperature is above 105. That is a medical emergency. You need emergent cooling. Um, so that is not sustainable with human life to get that high for that long. You'll just die. All right. So there's no way of heating your body up and doing that. Someone asked me to, can you, if you potentially get it, spray like steam in your nose, please, please don't do that. You're going to come and see us for many other reasons that I don't want to see you for. It's just going to be nasty. Please don't do that. Um, but then someone asked me too, you know, what if you go to a sauna? Um, Saunas probably aren't the greatest idea either. Um, you know, you can, you know, basically like breathe it in and then aerosolize it and spread it to everyone you're around. Um, so we know some of this data too, based on, um, so like sports, um, a lot of um, kids, you know, you guys see those articles where you have someone who's like a high school football player and they're mm -hmm. outside in the middle of summer and they come in kind of altered and their temperature is extremely high. Um, that's very dangerous for your body. So anything that you know you're attempting to do to increase your body to try and you know get rid of it, um, I would just completely avoid. I mean, you just gotta let it run its course, and there's no magic treatment for it. The magic treatment, and that we are trying to get to the public, don't get it in the first place. Use social distancing, quarantine. Thank you. Use social distancing, quarantine yourself if you have symptoms. Because once you get it, there's nothing you can do to just get it out of your body. Um, I also want to give this a plug too for you know kids during the summertime. Um, I get very concerned about things like heat strokes, heat exhaustion. Make sure you're drinking lots of fluids. If you get any symptoms, take a break. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to change anything. But if you stay out there, make sure your kids are safe and that they're out of the heat and get regular breaks. All right. All right, Mark. It's all you, man. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to follow that up and say that. Remember, so if for those of you who don't know, um, what the virus likes to do is it infects the bottom of your lungs. So it doesn't stay up here. People talk about being in your nose. It goes way down in your lungs, and that's why it causes the problems. And your body is really, really good. It's really good at maintaining the temperature it wants to, right? Otherwise, you're in trouble. So don't think that any of these alternative measures are really going to make a difference. I warn people, I'm not against holistic uh, measures. I'm not against some of the other stuff, but just remember there's a lot of people out there looking to make a buck and are gonna tell you things that's a little bit of pseudoscience, so be careful. I have to put it aside because I saw this here because Ralph asked me, are you more likely to die from coronavirus or his girlfriend Chanel? And it is definitely Chanel, 100%. She's dangerous, watch out for her. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have, I see questions in there. We're going to get to them. We're trying to get through most of this stuff. I'm going to do this next question. And I think we're going to try and tag on some of these ones that uh, people are asking. So um, we'll get to it. So I wanted to talk about one of the hot topics recently has been the thing with NSAIDs, right? So what is an NSAID and why does it cause a problem? Why do people think it might be worsening the coronavirus or COVID-19? So an NSAID is an anti-inflammatory. Um, it's a medication that we use um, you see it, obviously, people have had Motrin, things like that. It helps decrease the inflammation after an injury. It can also uh, decrease generalized inflammation. It's a good antipyretic. It helps if you're having any kind of fever. It can help bring down the temperature by decreasing the general inflammation and letting your body heal in a more um, slow and controlled method. Most of the NSAIDs that you guys would be dealing with or know of is the most popular one, obviously, is ibuprofen. Um, then you'll get naproxen. Uh, Ketorolac is the IV form, which you might get in the hospital. 
And then diclofenac is actually a topical form, um, which can be put on um, joints, tendonitis, things like that. So some of this gets to, and the reason Kevin let me get this question is because it gets into a little bit of the nerdy biochemistry, which I like to talk about, and some of the, the cellular anatomy, which I think is fun. So oh, you're right. <laughs> that's right. So um, what they're talking about now is the relationship of the virus to the ACE2 receptor. So to put it really simply, the ACE2 receptor is involved in helping you regulate your blood pressure. That's the really simple version. It's in the bottom of your lungs. It's on the vessels in your heart. It's on your kidney and on your liver. And those receptors are required. So the virus basically goes through, detects those receptors and goes into the cell using that receptor, basically hijacking it. So we think theoretically, right? Um, and a good idea would be that if there are more of those receptors in your body, the virus has an easier time getting into your cells and causing a wreaking havoc. This is all theoretical at this point. There's been no actual studies that have looked at this. This was came out of a physician in France who recognized that NSAIDs could uh, theoretically increase the ACE2 receptor in your body, therefore causing a theoretical increase in the amount of virus as it causes uh, gets into you. Um, it's all theoretical at this point. Right now, the basis basis for that science does exist. So therefore, we are recommending that people not use ibuprofen or any other form of NSAIDs. You have Tylenol. Tylenol works probably better at bringing down your fever and making you feel well. It has a completely separate mechanism of action. You do not have to worry about it causing the same problem. The only thing to think about with Tylenol is for my friends out there who are in the bar and nightlife industry, if your liver is a little bit sore, it might not be happy. But um, that's for general, honestly. Tylenol is a pretty safe medication if taken in moderation as directed, so it doesn't really um, uh, have a lot of issues, so we're recommending that. Um, on that note, I kind of slide into, I've heard somebody ask me about um, vitamins and supplements that people can use. Um, a lot of this information is really preliminary. It's really early. Um, I had one uh, article talk about a physician who said higher doses of vitamin A and D. This is in excess of your daily needs can theoretically increase your ACE2 receptor and therefore increase the, the potency of the virus. Um, totally theoretical at this point, something that people need to study. I don't know, it kind of makes sense to me. Um, I think if you're taking so much vitamin A and D um, that you're that this is going to be an issue that you have other things to worry about. Um, but um, I have seen things like zinc as a supplement, which has helped people. There's a conversation about IV calcium. Um, I'm sorry, IV vitamin C uh, being used in critical care. Um, but uh, that's going to kind of segue Kevin into his conversation about treatments um, and what people are doing for treatments. Um, do you want to take a second and try to answer some of these questions here? Uh, there's three I want to touch on if you want to look through some more. Uh, just They're going to be brief, though. Um, my friend Sam, hey, man, I haven't seen you in a long time. I hope you're doing well. Um, you were asking about uh, surfaces. I appreciate you listening to my last one. Um, Again, that was one study um, looking at, you know, surfaces, you know, uh, how long does the, the viral particles on different types of surfaces last? I tried to find some more research on this. No one's really doing much. Um, as some people pointed out too, the whole reason they put cardboard on there is probably from your Amazon Prime packages. Thanks. I was live. I wasn't really thinking about that. Um, but the idea um, of this uh, kind of gets back to, um, to some of these ideas, just like hand sanitizer and cleaning. Like if you wash your hands, you know, with hand soap um, for a, a certain amount of time and also gets back to the idea of temperature, the virus, you know, it's not immune to all of these things. So if you're cleaning your surfaces, the only thing I can find was the CDC website for your home guide. It said, if you clean your surface once a day, that typically will cover you for the most part. But that doesn't mean, you know, you shouldn't be washing your hands. If you have even like regular face masks, and I, I don't know if we got into face masks, we'll get into face masks. I have my own personal thoughts on this. If you have symptoms like you're coughing and a fever, it's better to have something than nothing in my opinion. Um, and if you don't have anything, at least cover, you know, don't just go up to people and start coughing on them, especially uh, where you live. Yes, just like that. So, um, you know, the CDC says at least one time a day. It doesn't say anything else. It doesn't say what to use. So that's the only thing I can find. Um, Suzanne asked, can BiPAP be converted to a ventilator? No, it cannot. 
Those are two different machines. Um, so if you have a CPAP at home, you know, some people use a CPAP for their sleep apnea. That's the same concept versus a ventilator breathing machine, which is very specific controls. They are two different machines. So this is an issue that we're having. We don't have a lot of ventilators. If you put someone on BiPAP, they can spread the particle all over. Can I and interrupt? The, my, sorry, the last one, okay. Julie Franks. She said, uh, she's got a friend who's COVID positive. Can you just drop meals at the door? Um, well, that's like so nice of you. Uh, yes, of course, just leave it at the door. You know, you don't even have to ring the doorbell and just run away, just text them. Um, I'm gonna give you my address. If you wanna drop food outside of my place, I would much appreciate it. So thank you, that's a great idea. Um, especially if you're just considering social distancing and you are not quarantined yourself. That's a great thing to help with our communities and really help each other out through this. All right. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> um, no, yeah, a lot of people. I mean, I remember the first year a doctor, he was on the Facebook group and he was having people uh, drop beer at the end of his driveway so that he could go pick it up. So that's definitely a thing we can do. Um, I had two questions which are similar. I want to address before we move on to the next one. Um, uh, so one person asked about if I have Crohn's disease and I'm on Remicade. And then another person asked if I have rheumatoid arthritis would I be at higher risk of the disease? So the answer is um, if you are on an immunomodulating medication, so these um, diseases which are secondary to um, the autoimmune disease, right, which are due to over uh, activation of your own immune disease, and the medication that we use tends to decrease your immune response. The short answer is yes, you are at higher risk. These are some of the people that we're looking at and we're concerned about because as those medications decrease your immune response and your immune system, it's going to decrease your body's ability to react to any kind of pathogen or uh, invas invasion, which is what this coronavirus is. So you are at higher risk. Um, what do you do about it? It's the same thing we've been talking about. These are what we're paying attention to is um, uh, mind your social distancing. Make sure that you are definitely being aware of how clean you're doing, um, keeping things. We talked about um, alcohol wipes seem to be the best thing. I believe it's 70% uh, alcohol kills all the viruses within one minute. Um, so maintain that. And then anybody around you, make sure that you're checking people. And um, if they're having symptoms, say, sorry, I love you, but stay away. So okay. that's the thing to keep in mind. All right, do you wanna move on to the next question, Kevin? Yeah, um, and Faha, just so you know, the six weeks viral shedding, um, you do need two consecutive negative tests um, to confirm it because of the accuracy that Mark had talked about just for him. Um, so this gets kind of into this idea of treatments. You know, um, everyone's getting very excited right now um, in the news that, oh, there's this thing, Plaquenil. If you combine it with this antibiotic, azithromycin, it's showing like all of these like great, great results. Um, there are some good results, but I need to make this very clear just for people who are not in medicine. COVID-19 is a virus. Um, it is not malaria. It is not a bacteria. It is a virus. There is no real treatment once you get it. All of these things help your immune system respond to it. They don't like a, an antibiotic actually breaks down bacterial walls, and destroys it. Antivirals help reduce replication and some of those other things. But they're not like a treatment. Um, so the treatments are taking care of your blood pressure if it's low and giving you blood pressure medications. If you're in respiratory distress, putting you on a breathing machine on a ventilator. If you have kidney failure, we treat the kidney failure. If you have an underlying pneumonia, then we treat the pneumonia with an antibiotic, but that's usually bacterial at that point. And I wanna, I wanna emphasize this as much as possible. The idea is not to treat. People get very excited. I've had a ton of questions about Plaquenil in this country. I don't even want you getting to that phase. We want to social distance and quarantine to prevent you from ending up on a breathing machine in an ICU bed with an experimental treatment. This stuff is all experimental. Um, it is not a treatment at all. We don't have great studies on it. It is promising but you don't wanna see yourself in a point where you're having to question whether or not some hopeful thing that hasn't been tried on more than a couple, you know, hundred patients is gonna work for you when we have a pandemic going on. So again, I'm trying to harp uh, as much as possible on this concept, just prevent getting it in the first place. Um, but since we are on that topic, um, Plaquenil itself is an anti-malarial drug um, and it also has some anti-inflammatory components. 
Um, what they're seeing, um, and I, I have a couple of random studies that looked out of this. Um, there's some out of France and some out of Japan. And what they did um, was that this is really for like the sickest of the sick patients. So they're in an ICU bed. Uh, they're like severe lung damage kind of all over. And they saw how Plaquenil worked um, and then used it with an antibiotic, the azithromycin, which a lot of people actually are placed on. Um, so you probably know azithromycin. And they actually saw favorable outcomes for a lot of these people. It looked like it uh, reduced a lot of the inflammation. Um, some people were taken off the breathing machine. Um, and then they looked to see how, and this gets back to Fahad's question about you know still having viral shedding. They looked six days out um, taking multiple samples of sputum, uh, swabs, blood, and they actually found no active particle on combination at six days with both of them. Um, but this was only 26 patients. Um, so again, when we're talking to, to most people who aren't in medicine, 26 patients means pretty much nothing to me. It's great that we're seeing these results, but it needs to be verified on large scales. And again, these are for the sickest of the sick patients. One thing they saw in Japan too is very similar. They had about 100 patients there. Um, they noticed increased effects. I couldn't find the source article, but a lot of them improved. So a lot of people too are asking me, well, why didn't my doctor pres uh, prescribe me Plaquenil? Why didn't I get azithromycin? This drug, it is basically used for three things, um, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and malaria, all right? So unless if you have one of those things, and I hope you don't have malaria, um, and I, I hope you don't have those other things either. Um, we have ways of testing, by the way, if you just say that you have lupus, we can do blood work to confirm that. So please don't lie to us. Um, we are trying to save this therapy for the sick patients. I don't see it as a, a viable form as a prophylaxis. The reason I say that is one, it hasn't been shown to be a prophylaxis drug. And if it has, it's still very early. And we do not have enough manufacturing to get this drug to everybody. The other thing I wanna harp on is just because we have something that potentially works on these sick patients, if you just give it to the general public, side effects. These drugs, um, they can prolong some of your heart conduction cycles and create lethal arrhythmias. So you go from people having these mild symptoms, you try and give them an experimental treatment and then they end up dying just from something they didn't even need. So we are saving this for our sick patients to see how it works. So don't expect from your local physician, from you know whatever movie star is taking it, I don't really care what the celebrities are doing. For the general public, it is not something that I see. And Mark, I don't know how you feel about this. I don't see this as prophylaxis. I don't see it even as viable data until we get more data from it, but it is something that we're looking at. It's certainly not anything that I think anybody's gonna move on on a large scale. They're starting to do the studies now to try and see if these medications can be used um, as preventative or for like individual cases. Like I said, um, the data is just not out there now. You have to understand, and the problem is uh, with certain people at the top of our administration, when you say something like treatment, everybody gets all excited. But you have to understand, I can treat you when you have ARDS or if you have a severe brain injury and you're concussed and you can't do anything, and that treatment is putting you on a ventilator and supporting you until you get better, um, which unfortunately, you know, it's not the ideal. Um, most of the data for the medications that are used, you did the chloroquine and azithromycin, are in um, critically ill patients. There are ones coming out of China that are looking at other medications. They're looking at some of the antiretrovirals, which were previously used to target HIV. Um, they've looked at uh, the combination of chloroquine uh, and the azithromycin. Um, for other people, I actually saw, there's a, I know he's laughing at it. Um, I actually saw a, a study coming out of Minnesota, which they're going to be using people that had um, contact, known contact with a coronavirus positive patient, um, testing them, and then putting them on a trial to see if it actually helps. So people are looking to see if this is actually going to make a difference and uh, if this is something that can be useful. Right now, we wouldn't recommend it. And Honestly, I had a, one of my rheumatology um, friends actually said that he's having difficulty getting it for his rheumatoid arthritis patients because people like celebrities are buying it and using it. Also, remember, you have to take a grain of salt when you hear a celebrity say, I took this medication and all of a sudden I feel better, right? Placebo sure. effect is something that's known. And we see that with a lot of medications, like people will come in with 
the flu and you'll give them antibiotics, they're like, oh my God, it made me better. It's like, no, you would have been better tomorrow anyway. It's not that medication that made a difference. Sometimes it's your own perception <clears throat> and it can be very skewed. So we really have to be careful about uh, analyzing and using the data that's out there and making sure that we're not giving people any kind of medication um, that's going to cause more harm than good. So don't feel like people are holding it back from you. People have to be really careful um, as that comes out. I think, you know, people are talking about using different kinds of treatments, but we have to be careful about it. All right. Are you, keep, are you mm -hmm. still going? I, I, I can answer some quick. I have two questions if oh, you want to keep going to the next it. topic. Um, so Tracy asked me, um, is, I've gotten this question a lot um, and variations of this question. Um, is it possible that coronavirus was around in January? You know, you can say February. Some people are like, has it been here since like October? Um, I can tell you, uh, we're not going to know. Um, the whole idea, again, of this being a novel coronavirus is the idea that novel means something new. Um, I have a very low suspicion, unless if you've been traveling to China back and forth, and I live in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I work in like more of a like a rural part, like away from the city. Um, I had someone, I think it was like September, ask me if they had coronavirus or something ridiculous. And uh, they had no contacts, had no exposure to it. And as far as I'm aware, it had not been to this country by then. Now, here's my thing for those people who ask, um, you know, you said you've been tested multiple times for flu. Um, and it's usually a kid that you're worried about. Um, I, I have to ask, you know, my my thing is, you know, most of the time there are so many viruses that cause the same thing. I tell parents, well, it's not flu. Um, flu, you can get Tamiflu for, which still isn't great, um, but give them fever control, drink plenty of fluids, have them rest, and then keep them out of daycare and away from everyone until their fever and symptoms resolve. And I have to assume that most kids, I'm gonna go ahead and put my, my license out here almost say the majority of kids do completely fine am i right i mean i don't hear you know these questions saying my like childhood died like that would be terrible you don't see that because most of the time you do fine and that's the same thing with covid i don't want to underplay that people die when they're younger from this we are seeing cases of that but if you go home and you've seen a provider like a physician who says i've examined you you know, I don't know what it is, go home, do these things. And, you know, they're probably playing right now and look completely fine. It doesn't really matter. And this goes back to the idea of testing. If you don't need to be tested, socially distance yourself, stay away from people. And if you have symptoms, quarantine yourself. All right. Um, sorry, one last one really quick. Um, uh, I had a, someone who said I'm five months pregnant on a biologic. Are you at an increased risk? Technically, yes because we don't have the data on it, I would assume that you are at higher risk for certain things. And like I talked about before, as you increase in pregnancy, you decrease the lung volume and you're just more uh, susceptible to things like lung infections. That doesn't mean you need to stop living your life, just social distance and definitely stay away from anyone who has symptoms as much as possible. But um, you know, as, as far as we see, um, there is this increased risk, but the younger patients, again, have decreased death rates and decreased mortality, even when you have some of these risk factors, we think, we don't know for certain, but you are at a slightly increased risk just being on a biologic and being pregnant, all right? I don't know what those numbers are, but it is a little bit. All right, Mark, sorry, go ahead. Uh, it's fine, I'm trying to check and make sure everything's working. Um, where were we? Oh yeah, so the next uh, question that we had coming from uh, before that we wanted to talk about, is can I have the flu and COVID at the same time? And the answer is yes. So the problem is it evidence shows that there's no um, co-immunity if you get COVID or influ influenza. Kind of makes sense actually, the viruses are very different in the way that they interact and the proteins, right? Remember when your body creates um, immunity to a virus in particular, the way that you get long-term immunity is through antibodies. Those antibodies bind to specific sites in the virus in the cells. They lock on and then basically make it so it doesn't work. So those antibodies are relatively specific to a species or a strain. Um, so they do think maybe um, with uh, subsequent strains you might have it. But for things like the flu, the regular um, uh, infections, even other versions of the coronavirus, the ones that cause a common cold, you can get them. Um, RSV, things like that. In fact, one of the problems is one of our other colleagues Igor, um, if he's in here, 
He likes to come in and troll us when we're going live because that's what he does. Uh, we love you. But he, he uh, yeah. did actually share a pretty interesting article which shows pretty high co-infection rates. I think it was up to 22% of people with coronavirus can be co-infected with influenza. So what does this mean? For you, really what it means is that if you come in and you get a positive flu test and you think that's what it is, you could still have coronavirus. It's not, doesn't say that you don't have it. So that's the other reason why we're saying, you know, honestly, if you have flu-like symptoms, you think you might have the flu, man, you gotta assume that you have coronavirus. You stay home, act like you have it, and you act like Kevin and go stir crazy and start making TikToks because you have nothing better to do. She'll talk about things that he's doing later. I wanna hear actually more about what Kevin's been doing to keep himself occupied in quarantine, because I might be there soon. I don't know yet, so we're gonna see, so. All right, um, I also wanna respond really quick to Tiffany Orlando. She said her son had a bad cough, a low grade temp of 99.8. Again, that is not a temperature by medical professionals. 100.4 is a temperature. That's without medications. If he took something, then you measured it, maybe, but that's not a temperature. Um, she was asking um, about, there's, it's a whole thing, but basically it's, um, he had a concern for COVID, but they wouldn't put it on for his employer, but he was told to self-quarantine. Should you get him tested since he still has a cough and a low-grade fever? Again, he's not actually having a fever, he's having a cough, all right? So that is a symptom, but there are so many things that cause a cough. And as I talked about earlier, um, there's specific guidelines for testing. If he's considered in a high risk area, and I have no idea where he works if offshores consider that, um, it has to be two tests. And that's for anyone, um, unless if you quarantine. So the quarantine period is, uh, I think we're getting away from 14 days and getting closer to one week. Um, so the seven plus three that I had talked about. So uh, it's tricky though. So. You should social distance no matter what, but if he has symptoms and he's still having symptoms, if he gets tested, he needs a second test to prove that it's negative. Um, because again, as Mark had mentioned, it's about a 70% accuracy. So his employer, you're gonna have to work that out with him. I don't have a great answer for you. That's just the data we know about the sensitivity of this test um, and people who don't get tested, all right? Um, Mark, I wanted to just kind of give people at home to um, just my take to um, I have been going crazy at home, like stir crazy at home. I've made two TikTok videos. I have an idea for five more. So look out for me. Corona Kamel on TikTok. Yeah, I've um, been having to deal with it because he sends me all the videos. He's like, what do you think about this? Yeah. Yeah, and I get this question like, man, I am so bored at home. Like, do I really, really need to be doing this? Like, like people are like dying on the couch. They're like, man, I got to get outside, you know, and you still can't get outside if you social quarantine. Um, but I want to give you guys just a brief look at um, what my daily life is like when I go to an ER. Um, because I had the same thought. I'm like, man, I'm really bored. Um, and I've been away from work now for a little over a week. Um, but uh, one of the big things is like most of the time, you know, if you've ever been to a hospital or if you're at home right now, it's nice. It's calm. You probably have like a glass of wine or some bourbon. You're watching us speak, chilling. You know, you, it's not chaotic for you. It's probably very boring. When I go into work every day, I have my cup of coffee. I go in through the main lobby. You know, I get greeted by everyone. Everyone's really nice. Everyone's really calm. They have that Southern charm about them. Everyone tells me that, you know, bless my heart. And I'm like, thank you. I go and I sit in my lounge before my shift. A little quiet. I catch up on some news, check my social media. And when I go into the ER, um, it is a, a different world if you've never experienced it. Before the pandemic even came, uh, where I work is chaos a lot of the time. You have people bleeding. You have people throwing up all over the place. You have people screaming in pain. And that's all the time, 24 seven. Um, and it is just total chaos in the emergency room. A lot of physicians don't even like coming down to see patients in the ER because it's just so chaos or so chaotic for them. And, you know, it's hard for us to work in that environment. You know, uh, the TV shows don't get it right. I'm not sitting down at my desk, you know, trying to plan my next vacation or, you know, catch up on my Facebook or even answer a text. And that drives my family crazy. I know, you know, I go for 12 hours and I don't text people back and they're like, what are you doing? It is nonstop in the ER. And what we're getting to is this point where it's really calm for most of America right now. You're sitting at home and you're bored. Good. 
because when I go into work, I'm covered in PPE. I'm trying to diagnose people with whether or not they have coronavirus, if they have something else. I still have strokes that are time sensitive. I have heart attacks I need to treat that are time sensitive. And people are yelling and screaming. You get a gunshot wound that comes in or you get someone having an acute stroke that takes up all of our resources. It is chaos in there. And I want to reiterate, we are not doing this to make your life miserable. I'm not doing it to, you know, promote anything. I specifically made this live video without politics, without the idea of religion, without anything else to give you the facts and a, a window into our lives. It is chaos down there before this started. It is chaos now. And I've texted colleagues from around the country that I'm friends with. It is bad out there. I mean, we are, I mean, I can't really comment on each individual ER, but it is hard for us just to begin with. This is making it very, very difficult to manage everyone appropriately, make sure everyone gets everything that they can. So as much as it sucks, and this is the hardest thing for younger, younger people, is that it's spring break time, you know, uh, like, you know, they want to go down and party. It is for a reason we're asking you to social distance and quarantine because this is very dangerous. People are underplaying it. I don't think our front line seeing what we're seeing and it's just ramping up. The next one to two weeks, I am not really looking forward to going into work. It is very difficult for us. Um, that's just my insight into what we deal with and the chaos. I've had five, six people talking at the same time about different things. We're trying to make quick decisions and we're trying to do what's best for everyone, but it is crazy out there. So please, please do these things we're asking. It will make a difference. And it might be a while that we do this, but it saves lives. It helps us and it keeps us sane too. Mark, I don't know if you have any thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna reiterate a lot of what he said. You gotta understand that what we're doing right now is not necessarily to save everybody that's here. It's not like we think this is gonna be quarantine where our, uh, what's the I mean, pandemic where everybody's gonna die. What you guys are doing is you're sparing us in the healthcare system. You have to understand that as this comes in, strokes, heart attacks, uh, gunshots, uh, car accidents, they don't stop. Here in the United States, we have uh, 2.5 hospital bed per capita, which is one of the lowest in the um, uh, civilized uh, countries and uh, first world countries. So that means if um, the current rates say that about 15% of people over 85% will get critically ill and die from this. If 15% of our nursing home patients right now show up to the emergency department, that is all the resources, that is everything I have. And this is a shout out again, all of my nurses, EMS, tech, mm -hmm. everybody that's there, everybody, a lot of people have actually tuned into this. You guys know, you guys are in the front lines with it just as much as we are. It's not just us, it's a big team effort. And a lot of people are putting themselves at risk. I've had um, a couple of nurses and a couple of people already who have been there, who have been uh, exposed to coronavirus. I've had two people that I know who've had it and been sick and been out of work. I have one friend who is actually pregnant. She's 38 weeks pregnant, trying to figure out if she should go to work because she's a nurse and she's going to be exposed to it. What do we do? Right. So that's a side that's, you know, the, the healthcare workers putting themselves at risk. But then understand that when we're in the emergency department and we have eight coronavirus people and then we have somebody else, a lot of times we don't have the time and the, the energy or the even the manpower to get to, right? So if there's eight people that show up at the same time, if I am supposed to spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes with all of them and they're all critically ill, I've already used up most of my time in the emergency department, that's four hours. That means if it took me four hours to come see you, it's not because I'm twiddling my thumbs and sitting there being like, oh, I don't really care about this person. It's probably because somebody else is sicker. So um, yeah, that's how the emergency department is. When it's wild, it's wild. We get, I don't, in my place where I work, sometimes I get a little bit of a lull um, or I get a chance to uh, check some texts, but that's really not, not typical. And you have to be mindful that we are usually overworked and overburdened. And if this adds a little bit more than it could be a lot. Um, there's the thing with face masks. Do you want me to cover that now? Do you want to talk about that? There's a question down here from Barbara asking about this. Um, people are asking, should they sew masks? Um, I've, I've gotten a ton of questions. You know, people feel like they want to know, what can I do uh, to help the medical field right now? 
Um, would you mind talking about face masks, some of the things that you've seen and what your thoughts are? Yeah, so we're gonna tag team this a little bit because frankly, Kevin got a little bit into the, more into the research than I did, but um, essentially, so when it comes to the masks and the, the hand zone and things like that, the, the evidence isn't great. A lot of people are we're trying really hard to try and help out and try to supply things. But unfortunately, when it comes to coronavirus itself, um, the only thing that is known to really make a difference are those N95 masks. So those of you out there who were crying when I had to shave my beard, I understand I cried too. But the reason why is because you need a tight fitting mask. The virus can be as low as 0.2 uh, microns in diameter which basically means that anything that isn't tight fitting to your face or doesn't cover that area means the virus can get in. There has been also some evidence that in uh, the cloth uh, face mask, which is what they're talking about, that that can actually ask that that um, moisture that gets in the front of it can actually act as a reservoir for growth of the virus can actually sit there and make things worse. Now, people are looking into trying to come up with masks and other ways to do things outside of people being exposed to coronavirus um, and outside of that exposure. And potentially, um, I don't know, I wish my experience as a surgeon told me more. I think, you know, there were um, some of the, the um, headbands and stuff like that. When I was there, they were getting away from any of the hand-sewn or custom-made masks. Those might make a comeback so we can uh, save some of the masks for our frontline people and for our healthcare workers. Um, for some healthcare workers, they are saying like level three masks might help um, but the reality is, unfortunately, um, N95s are the only thing that are known to really uh, prevent, so nobody's crying, or only thing that actually prevents you contracting it and prevents you from actually getting it and breathing it in. Um, there are different versions of it. I've seen people with the big gas masks. I have seen that those have the same um, uh, filter as the N95, so those can be effective. They're obviously a little bit overkill but you basically need an N95 or greater in order to actually prevent uh, contracting the disease. So unfortunately, as of right now, I can't definitely say that they're helpful. It's, it's tough. I want to, people are moving and mobilizing to try and help. And that's a really inspiring thing. I have to say for myself, uh, watching people do that and people doing what they can to try and um, try to improve it and help people out and help us in the healthcare field has been one of the things that's really uh, galvanized me and, uh, maybe inspired by this, but um, we're looking for better ways to do it. I would hold Kevin. Go ahead. And uh, yeah, I was going to say um, the the study I looked at. They took sixteen hundred people and they separated it. So um, about half got surgical grade or um, sorry, hospital grade masks, and then the other half got just cloth masks. And what they saw was there was a huge difference. Um, so the people who had the cloth mask, ninety seven percent of the particles not only just stuck to the mask but they could be breathed in um and then you know it doesn't really do anything one of the issues that he mentioned too is that we're having this huge problem in our country just in general where we're running out of this stuff you know um, we need the masks that are tight fitting all the way around your face um some people talk about papper who are in the medical field don't even worry about that if you're not in it those are not widely available. I will tell you that now. There are not enough. And for any resuscitation, there's anywhere from like five to 10 people in a room. We're not all going to come in with a big old hooded mask and like a, a tank. We don't have that. So we need these masks and we need hospital grade masks. Um, there were some people that sent me a link um, for some, I, I forgot, it was like a Deaconess hospital out of like Indiana, I think. I love the intention. I think it's great that Americans are innovative, that we care about our healthcare workers, that you guys are trying to do what you know you can to help us. I think the thing that is going to help us, you talk to your representatives and you talk to your senators and you get us the funding that we need so we can have this mobilized by the correct facilities. I don't need a cloth mask that's probably going to worsen it for me. I mean, if you have an N95, that seems to be the best. A surgical mask isn't cutting it doing absolutely nothing and having nothing like a bandana, and I know that's all over the news, does nothing. We need hospital grade equipment. And I don't need someone who's at home not seeing 20 or 30 patients keeping those from us. We need these resources. You guys need to do a difference for us and help us with voting. Talk to your representatives, talk to your senators, get these things mobilized. 
I mean, we did this during wartime, you know, we mobilized and we were a manufacturing country and we made things, you know, it's not like we're incapable of doing it, but you also have to realize, you know, Elon Musk said he was going to do it with some of his factories. That is not, oh, I'm going to do it. I want to. And it starts tomorrow. You got to equip the factory for it. You have to get all the products there. You have to have all the materials made and it has to be specific material. All these YouTube videos, the DIY projects, I like the idea, but it is not going to protect me. It's not going to protect him. Sorry, you're that way. It's not going to protect him. It's not going to protect my nurses, my respiratory techs, who are one of the highest risks. Um, you know, we got to protect our staff, our EMS crews, and we need these things. So making your face mask at home, again, great concept. In reality, in practice, um, I would rather have you call and harass your representative and senators to get this mobilized so we are prepared and we have the resources. Quick one um, for the medical providers and anybody else that might be watching. Um, there was a link that was shared for me from the um, coronavirus uh, Facebook group that says that there is evidence you can autoclave. There's a method for autoclaving the N95s in a pinch. Um, people have been talking about having people wash them and reuse them, which is totally ridiculous because um, exposing it to moisture and washing it decreases the ability of it to adhere and decreases the um, ability for it to prevent. So autoclaving um, kind of makes sense because it can decontaminate it and maybe not affect it. I've seen something on there. I'm going to try and share that. That's the most I've heard, but that's the point where we're at is we're taking these claw things and having to autoclave them because we are out. Yeah. And, and again, that goes to what you're saying is um, right now they're saying we're getting a fair amount of young people and a lot of hospital workers are saying that right now, people who are becoming more critically ill now in these programs are your doctors, nurses, and the healthcare workers. So we're the ones at higher risk. Um, we're the ones who are still there, who are treating people and showing up, seeing those signs. I showed up to work for you, stay home for me. That's why we're trying to try to get this under control. All right. Um, do you want to talk to you about uh, some of the I know some people had asked me, you know, what is the actual deal with younger patients, you know, below 60, below 40? Are they actually getting sick? Are some of them dying? Um, I don't know what you've seen from that, but can you talk uh, uh, on what you've seen, Mark? Yeah. So as it's kind of coming out in the news, it's going to say the same things. Um, initially, the a lot of the reports came from elderly people, right? So our initial data came from China based on the death rate that they saw, which showed that basically you're at higher risk greater than 85 um, was about 15% and then 60, I think it was 4% and then general population was one. But unfortunately we are seeing it in younger people. Um, you have to understand that, and I've heard lots of cases and actually people have been sending me uh, texts and messages about, you know, their 30 year old friend or uh, 40 year old friend. So we are seeing it in cases in people that are younger now. Um, there does seem to be evidence that uh, children uh, between the ages of, um, I think it's four to 14, um, I have a certain amount of protection. I think that's the most recent one that I saw. So children do seem to be protected as you get older. Um, most of the cases for me, I anecdotally kind of putting stuff together um, has been most people um, over 30. Usually if you're less than 30, I haven't seen any cases or anything reported of anybody less than 30, but we are getting people that are younger that are critically ill and we are getting people that are dying. Um, I just saw a news report here in Los Angeles of a young man, um, he was a father who uh, passed away from it, who was actually uh, mostly asymptomatic, had a little bit of a cough, happened early in the stage and basically uh, went home, woke up, wasn't really breathing and died. So this is not just for young people. And I think, you know, this is not out there to scare people. We're not there. Again, the whole uh, motto is um, be smart, don't panic. So don't panic, be smart. Most of us still, the uh, likelihood of you getting sick and dying from coronavirus over this course is probably less than you dying in a car accident or trauma overall. It's just a new um, risk that's there. But you see those spring breakers out there and see people not taking it seriously. If you see people not taking it ser seriously, um, you need to pay attention and say something to them because it's happening to younger people. You're not immune to this disease just because you're under the age of 40. That is not the case. Um, I talked in my, and I, Kevin, I don't know if you want me to touch on this, I can. In my talk yesterday, I talked about the actual risk factors and the numbers. Um, there are specific data on um, those risk factors, what makes you at higher risk. I can talk about that or I can say, look at my last video. 
Uh, yeah. Um, let me just get a quick shout out to one of our friends as well, um, Dr. Aileen Gregosian. Um, many of you probably have not heard of her if you're not in medicine or if you don't know the transplant world. She was in our training program, um, young, completely healthy. Um, uh, and Aileen, I hope you don't mind if I share a little bit of your story, but you know, just briefly, it was, I think, December um, of a year, oh, a little over a year ago. Um, she yeah. was just like us, normal person, right? Got a viral upper respiratory infection. It was not coronavirus, okay? Um, she just got a viral upper respiratory infection over like a week or two, got progressively worse, got short of breath, ended up coming into the ER, ended up coding where she lost her heartbeat at one point, had to have chest compressions and was placed on a breathing machine. Turns out she developed like a cardiomyopathy, which is basically an abnormal functioning heart. So it wasn't squeezing anything. It's like she was in heart failure. And we have no idea why. Um, you know, you could not predict that. You could not see it. She is very lucky. She is doing great right now. She got a heart transplant. She is a heart transplant survivor. If you can follow her, like her stuff, um, she is amazing. But that does not mean, you know, uh, with COVID, I think one of my concerns I have is that we don't know what risk factors younger people have. We had a 39 year old in New Orleans. Um, and just to reach out to the family, I'm very sorry for your loss. I mean, this is terrible. Um, I don't know anything around the circumstances, really. She was 39. Um, I think it's Natasha, if I'm saying that right, Ott, um, had just these viral symptoms, no risk factors as far as I'm aware. Um, and she died this past Friday and tested positive for COVID. I mean, it does kill people. And I think in my last video after rewatching it, um, I, I wanted to emphasize um, it's still uncommon, but it is possible. And you just don't know who it's going to be. In China, they had a 14 year old boy that died from it. And again, while that's rare, we're seeing people who are younger have you know cases of mortality that they die. Um, this is concerning to us because we don't know what those risk factors are. The same way like during pregnancy, we don't know what it does during pregnancy. So we can't give you any good information. So until we actually know these things and we have a better idea of what is potentially causing it, you have to social distance. And it's not doing that because we wanna be mean or make you lose your spring break or separate you from your families. It is to stay safe, all right? Um, so the death rate in younger patients, it's not zero. Um, it's low, but it's not zero. And until we get some more data on this and we figure this thing out together, you know, you guys, you have to be careful out there. Um, so Mark, if you want to talk more about the, you know, risks, um, stats, things like that, that's totally up to you, man. I, yeah. I'd like to hear. If people want to, I mean, if you want to hear it, you can say it real quick. But so um, the original stats essentially showed that um, the main risk factors, man, if I can remember all this, um, hypertension. So we said it goes to the ACE2 receptor, diabetes, um, respiratory illnesses, that's asthma and COPD and then any kind of cardiovascular disease, right? So we know that coronavirus likes to target the lungs. We know that it likes to target the heart. That's the big thing. That's the reason it's killing people. And then it targets the kidney and the liver. Now I talked in my other video about how that actually happens and like the big whopping infection that it causes and actually ARDS, what that is. Please allude to that. If people really want me to talk about that and go into um, why coronavirus uh, causes such a severe illness, I can. Put that in the comments here. We're going to be here for a little bit answering questions. So if you want me to elaborate on that more, I can. But basically, um, I think it was 80% um, higher with uh, hypertension, 40% with diabetes, and then 20% with respiratory infections like asthma and COPD. It's quick off the cuff, I'm trying to do it on my head, so I might be a little bit uh, inaccurate in that. But that's those are those stats. Um, I just want, uh, I, I saw some people keep asking the same questions, uh, just for uh, Christy who asked a question, she said she's take, taking Plaquenil already. Um, you should not have any difficulty getting continued scripts for Plaquenil. Um, I would stock up right now if you have something like known RA or lupus. Um, those people, um, they get continued things. Uh, the treatment, like I said, and I'm very cautious using that term, it's only like five to six days taken twice a day. So it's not a ton of pills, but now that everyone's getting it in social media, just get your supply because you should have your normal supply. That shouldn't be an issue. Also for Beth Dover, she was concerned about 
what do I do if I bring groceries home into our houses? What precautions should I take? Um, again, um, if you're going out and getting groceries, you need to eat, you know, it's just something you do. You have to go to a grocery store. Um, again, there's nothing magical to this. Um, you need to wash your hands. If you have fruit, wash it. Um, if you have packaged things, that's fine, especially frozen stuff. Um, if you're going to cook it and eat it right before you eat, wash your hands. Um, that, that's, that's really most of the stuff. Good hand hygiene, washing everything because people will touch fruit and go all over. You don't know what's on it. Um, but if you're washing it, um, keeping it clean, um, I don't see any issue why you can't just have a regular, you know, otherwise meal. You don't need to be freaking out about, you know, coronavirus particles all over your sandwich or, you know, your, your protein powder, which is more me. That's, that's my thing. <laughs> Uh, you don't need to worry about that stuff. All right. Yes. Yes. Look at those guns. <laughs> all right, Mark, if you want to keep going, uh, I, I'm trying to see what other, I know I actually, we have a lot of questions. So, um, Pam Camel asked if I can elaborate. So I'll elaborate. I'm going to do my little spiel on that. But as I said, um, we are going to give an update about what's going on. We have the total number of infected from Johns Hopkins, which appears actually at this point to be the most accurate. I think it was 30,000. I wrote it down. Um, and how fast it's spreading. We can talk about that. They talk about the doubling numbers, stuff like that. Um, it's basically we're better than Italy, worse than Germany, kind of somewhere in between. Testing would be nice. Um, uh, and I do want to talk about this. So this is one of the things. So Sean asks, do you think that the stay-at-home guidelines from the state are enough to contain this? And so the answer is this goes back to why are we doing this and why are we keeping people at home and what is that flattening of the curve? So we have to understand from the research that I did, it looks like we expect everybody in this country at some point to get this, uh, to begin, sorry, 60 to 70% of the country is gonna get this disease at some point. The reason Potential. we're doing these, what? Potentially. Potentially, That's right? So, so up to, so they're saying up to 70% of people are gonna get it, right? So with the treatments and the things going out, with you have the disease in ARDS, and I'll talk about what it does. If you come in and you end up on a ventilator, we might be able to treat you, right? So we might be able to put you on a ventilator, get you those medications, get you better, should you be critically ill. But if everyone gets sick at the same time and under a shorter time frame, now we have a problem. Now we have the conversation in the situation we have now where we're trying to ration ventilators, trying to ration masks, trying to come up with ways to try and help people. There's conversations about using one ventilator for more people. So the point is, it's not really gonna, it may not fix the disease, um, but it should slow it down. That being said, Singapore had widespread testing. They quarantined the F out of everybody. And they are basically have had no cases and they're seeing a decrease in their infection and their death rate. So if we were able to institute those same things here, we would actually be able to make a substantial difference. And um, I mean, part of it, you got to remember places like China and Hong Kong are in a little bit more autocratic this society. We can't like, you know, institute martial law here yet. That would probably be bad. I don't I don't support that. Kevin, stop it. And then um, so that makes it a little bit more difficult. So um, Pam did ask me to elaborate on what it does. So the reason coronavirus it causes critical illness and why it's bad. First of all, we said it's silent, which is the problem can be um, people can be asymptomatic up to 86 percent of the time but also the way that it goes. So it's a, a novel uh, virus, right? So new, and I did steal that from Kevin and I get to say that, sorry about that. But novel basically means our bodies haven't seen it. We think it jumped either from bats or pangolins. So what happens is when your body sees something that it doesn't identify, if it does a little bit, it can see it basically activates a little bit of the immune system and says, oh, all right, we're gonna take it out, fine. But if it sees something that's like crazy or if it doesn't recognize, it kind of goes haywire. Your body has a little bit of a, of a scorched earth approach to uh, some immune systems and certain things. And what happens is if it takes that scorched earth approach, it kind of napalms everything. And those things that it's napalming are your lungs, your heart, your kidney, and your liver. So what we see is something you might've heard of called a cytokine storm when you get activation of the virus and then activation of the immune system. And that leads to something we call ARDS, which is basically a buildup of fluid and then scar tissue and fibrosis in the bottom of the lungs. We see this, that disease process is not specific to coronavirus. We know how to treat that disease process and other things and ICUs and critical care physicians deal with that in other places, but they are finding that it's causing that at a higher rate. So that basically it's kind of a liquefaction. So it liquefies your insides, those cells, 
turns them into motion and then they can't work. And when your lungs don't work, you don't breathe very well. If your heart doesn't work well, I don't need, think I need to elaborate. So that's basically what we're seeing. And that's, again, that speaks to why the, the treatments and the medications that we're using are basically aimed towards decreasing that effect, that overreaction from your immune system, as opposed to actually eliminating the virus. If we can get to the point where the body is dealing with it normally, and can take a more measured approach, then we might see some better outcomes. So that's kind of, that's a quick and dirty version of pathophysiology. <laughs> Yay. Oh, love it. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to move on to one more question, if you don't mind. Did you have anything yeah. else you wanted to? Um, so someone, uh, <laughs> someone sent me a message um, that was really interesting. Uh, they said, hey, you know, I thought I had pretty bad symptoms. I went to the ER um, thinking, you know, I need to get admitted. Um, I'm kind of mad because one of my friends who had similar symptoms also went to the ER and they were sent home on this and this and they did this test and they did nothing for me and just sent me home. Um, what is my approach to someone that comes in with coronavirus uh, symptoms and what am I giving people when they're discharged, if they're okay to discharge from the ER. Um, and this is gonna be uh, just separating. If people need to get admitted, we're going to admit you to the hospital. If you're going home, um, we have already examined you and this is gonna vary a lot. Um, not everyone is me, not everyone is him. You have a lot of variation. We do have some things that are considered kind of standard of care is what we call it in, uh, in medicine where there's certain things that we have to do um, just to create a standard. But with coronavirus itself, because it's all new and we don't know, a lot of these things, and again, I wanna emphasize this, like Plaquenil and all of these things are experimental. They are not considered standard treatment. They are not standard of care practice. Um, the isolation, the quarantine periods, those are standard. Um, how we treat someone on ventilator settings, we get training on and our intensive and our RTs, they all have extensive training to manage that. Those things we have standards of care on. Um, but when you come in, um, you know, a lot of times if I'm going to send you home, I've asked you a ton of questions uh, to see what your risks are. I have a set of vitals for you. Um, I've done a physical exam and I think a lot of people get angry when they don't get the same exact thing that someone else did because they feel like, you know, why didn't I get that? If you come into the ER and you have a very unsuspicious story, you have completely normal vital signs and minimal symptoms, sometimes I might not do any tests and just send you home. If you have some other things, and again, I've spent a decade in medicine learning this, practicing it. Um, you know, if there's things that we pick up on um, that indicate that you need to get a test, we might test you for flu. We may not. We may also get something like a chest X-ray. We may not. We could also do something like a chest X-ray and we may not. If we hear something in your lungs, maybe we do. If you have underlying lung disease and you have like a fever, but you need to realize that everyone is different and you shouldn't be angry. I would be glad if someone said, you know what? I've examined you, I think you're fine to go home. You're not ending up in an ICU bed, unconscious, chemically sedated, fighting for your life with an experimental drug. You are going home. So I just need to just get this back out again to people who aren't in medicine, who don't have our training, who don't have our background. Um, we still try and do what we think is best for you. And a lot of time it's not admitting you to the hospital if we don't think you need to come in. A lot of times we don't have a clear answer of what it is either. We may say, you know what, it might be COVID-19. I don't know. You can get the test, but it will take days to get back. And that's kind of for Ellie. Um, our tests, I think, still take a couple of days. So even if you get tested, I'm not going to know if you have COVID for days. Um, they're trying to get a rapid test, but I don't even know if it's going to be available where I work. From the larger institutions, maybe. But I'm probably not going to know up front because there's a ton of different viruses and I can't run every test under the sun. It's just not feasible for everyone. So I may tell you to go home. Um, Sam, you had asked me to what medicines can I take? Cause we had talked about NSAIDs. Tylenol is pretty universally safe. Um, unless if you have like a really bad allergy, 
Um, you know, some liver transplant patients, they don't want taking it either. Um, but, you know, if you have cirrhosis, um, you know, I think you can still take up to two grams. Um, if you're a kid, there's guidelines on the liquid form, how much you can take. You can otherwise take Tylenol if you have a fever, if you have like muscle aches or just need generalized pain control. Sometimes we can give you some Flonase, like a nasal steroid, just to help with like the runny nose. But drink plenty of fluids and social distance yourself in quarantine, especially if you have symptoms. There is no magic cure to this, all right? So if you come in, don't expect a full workup because a lot of times, you know, we don't think people need it all the time and we're trying to conserve our resources anyway. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna do what we think is best for you, but just be aware that it's gonna vary different, all right? Um, so I heard, I'm gonna do it real quick. So my friend Phil, I'm getting messages here on my phone that he was asking a question about pneumonia. So Phil, if you're still watching, re-ask that question, I didn't quite understand. Um, somebody brought up uh, elderberry. Uh, so this was interesting. I actually had my um, aunt cousin, so it's uh, basically an uh, aunt once removed, um, asked me about elderberry because she uses it for immune disease, um, for immune support. So a lot of the supplements, I actually did look at elderberry itself. So interestingly enough, um, it is an antioxidant. So my understanding is that actually doesn't uh, seem to help with this particular um, process because some of those antioxidants tend to be more focused on the um, immune system that's modulating for uh, bacteria. Again, there's no data. So in there, I kind of looked at the science and sort of tried to put the two together and says probably not. Um, the only things that they found help at zinc, they are looking at actually making a difference. I have found most people are vitamin, B, my, vitamin D deficient. If you're vitamin D deficient, um, then hopefully supplements can help. I heard a lot, there's a lot of, that's its own controversy with vitamin D and what to take, that's its own kind of thing. Um, there's some evidence that vitamin C has been helping people, but that's only been really studied in the critically ill people and done through IV. That's a whole can of worms that exists in the critical care literature. Um, so uh, I would say elderberry, uh, it's not gonna hurt you, not really gonna help. The only interesting thing that I did see, I saw someone talking about the licorice protein. There's a there's a study from um, there's a study from China on the SARS, the original SARS virus, showing that um, some of the proteins out of uh, black licorice can help to interfere. Um, that does not mean by any means go out and buy a whole supplement thing of black licorice. It doesn't make that big a deal. It hasn't been well constituted. There's studies out there. Those are linked in my personal profile. I have all that stuff. Um, but maybe having, if you can tolerate it, those people like me who actually like black licorice, if you eat a little bit of it, maybe it'll help. So I do. Kevin, don't give me your crap. No, I'm just saying, I think um, if anyone tells you that this thing cures it, um, oh, yeah. we are both part of a national group of the smartest people I have ever met. And we're trying to summarize that information to you. Much on more what, than me. I, I will tell you, um, if we don't know, and we have case controls, randomized control studies, and then we're trying to get up to like the best studies possible, and we're telling you that we don't know, I really think someone's trying to sell you something. That's the same thing that happened when I talked about copper having the, the most activity against you know a viral, particles that land on something don't go buy all the copper and like you know cover your house in copper you don't need to do that you need a hand wash you need to cover your cough and you need a social distance in quarantine all right you don't need to go buy all this like supplements none of it has been shown or proven to do any of these things the same way plaque azithromycin having these are just theories and we're trying to get you guys to understand as best as possible why we think these things are working, but also the expectations that it's not going to be widely available and that, you know, if you're taking something, you like it, sure. But I, in my medical opinion, I don't think elderberry, uh, elderberry Japanese knotwood was brought up, um, some vitamins. None of it has been shown to do anything. It is a virus. It needs to kind of work its course. And if you have worse health problems, if you have comorbidities, it's going to be much harder for you to fight it. That's what it comes down to. That is the real. There's no magic bullet, magic thing that you can take. All right. If you could decide to cover your house in copper, please invite me. I want to see this happen. I'd love to see it and see how it goes. Obviously, if you decide to go that road, road um, please message me and invite me. Um, yeah. Do you want to go? Do you want to go on with yours? I, there's a couple questions here that might be worthwhile. 
I've got two questions I'd written down. I can cover them really quick if you want to look at some others yeah, um, just to see. Um, so Ron, he asked me, what's the best advice for someone who's due to have their baby any day? Same stuff, right? So, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of research. Uh, I, I saw a study that came out about, um, uh, I, I mentioned this on my first podcast. So they had nine women in China um, that had, that were actually diagnosed and confirmed that they had COVID who were in their third trimester and they gave birth and they did C-sections because I think the concern um, is whether or not the mom will transmit the virus to the baby. Um, that's called vertical transmission. That's something that we're concerned about as well. And what they did was they had a C-section because they don't know if vaginal births cause it. I have a pretty low suspicion that it does, but we don't have data on it. Um, what they saw was that when they had a C-section, they tested the babies for like multiple different like things. They checked the cord, they checked the baby themselves, all these things. They had no, and this was only nine like newborns, all right, but none of them had any evidence of it, which is good. Um, there was another study that I looked at, and hold on, let me just pull this up because I want to make sure I have the right um, info for you. But there was this really interesting study looking at these tests. Um, oh, so this, this is really cool. So they took um, a thousand different samples of people who actually had coronavirus and they tested some pretty gross stuff. But uh, so they basically said, OK, they had a CAT scan that confirmed COVID. All right. And yes, for those asking, you can confirm coronavirus on CAT scan. They did swabs of the actual lungs. They did swabs of the back of your throat. They did nose swabs. They did um, sputum that you, uh, uh, you just cough up. They took blood samples. They checked feces, that's my favorite one, and they checked urine. And what they saw was to see where the virus was being kind of secreted, all right? So what fluids does it show up in? Because that can be directly correlated to something like a vaginal birth. Um, so, uh, they unfortunately didn't do it because, uh, you know, uh, we're just not a lot of studies on pregnant women. Um, what they saw was, um, the highest obviously is going to be a direct sample from the lung. Um, then they saw that the swabs and then the nose, um, those were not great. They're like 70 ish percent, which is what we're seeing in our testing and why just one test is not great to reiterate that concept. Um, they saw this kind of nasty, but 29% of people who had tested positive had it in their feces. So what I had mentioned yet on my last one, you can have GI symptoms. So if you're at home with someone and you're concerned, sleep in a different bed, try and use a different bathroom. Um, cause there could be some transmission where, you know, you're washing your hands, but you're touching the sink, you get particles. It happens more often than you think, which is kind of nasty, but it's a it's just a thing. All right. Don't don't freak out about that. Um, but wash your hands 20 seconds. OK, um, but you can see it in these other things. All right. So just uh, if you have a newborn, wash your hands. We don't have a lot of data on it. We see newborns have mild symptoms. I still don't think there are any fatalities below the age of 10. But newborns, um, especially if they're in a neonatal ICU or if they have underlying lung issues, they can have more severe disease. I still have not seen anything in the literature that says that there's anything about um, any deaths. If you're going to breastfeed, make sure you, again, just general hygiene, wash your hands. If the mom has symptoms, have her, you know, wear a face mask and wash her hands as much as possible. All right. Sorry, that was a little longer than I wanted. Um, Mark, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's, I got a couple here that I, I think I want to try to address. So Tracy asked, do y'all know, oh gosh, I'm losing it. Um, do y'all know in the practice, what the practice is when someone gets sent home from work, still working because it's essential. If they test positive, should we expect to hear that we were exposed or not? Um, I think this means um, what's the, st the statute in place if you are exposed to someone's coronavirus? Um, my understanding is it's not great. I would not rely necessarily on your workplace. Depends on where you work. Um, HR and the hospitals um, and the ones that I've been working at have been working to try and improve that. I am supposed to get a call. In fact, I was supposed to hear today. If someone was positive, I haven't heard yet. So fingers crossed that I'm not going to be quarantined here anytime soon. Um, there are supposed to be um, things instituted in place that to try and prevent. So if you are exposed to somebody 
or if you work with somebody that's been exposed, somebody should let you know that that those are things that the government's trying to push towards um, to try and get workplaces to do that. Because we're trying to know the more that we know the spread of the disease and the more we can affect it, the, the better. So um, that's that question. Another, uh, Ashley asks, when someone does present with suspicious symptoms, is it recommended to run a standard respiratory viral panel, flu, rhino, other coronas, providing these are all negative, does this increase suspicion of COVID? So we did talk about this earlier. So the problem is, you can be sick with something else like the flu and still have coronavirus. If you're positive for other things in a respiratory panel, you can still have it. It doesn't help us. Frankly, and we talk about it, and I take the same method that Kevin does. If you come to my emergency department, so even before all this, right? If you come to my emergency department, you have a fever, sore throat, you're coughing, but you look good. You can get by. I can give you stuff you can eat and drink. You're not dehydrated. You don't need to be on a ventilator. You don't need oxygen. Usually I say, you don't need a swab. You, you feel sick. Here's some stuff to make you feel better. See you later. The respiratory panel doesn't help us, partially because it can be falsely negative in a lot of uh, a lot of instances. You can get a flu swab and half the time it can be wrong, right? So you don't have the flu, but you did. So it doesn't really help us. We go by our clinical suspicion and what we see in our expertise in our practice and say, are you somebody that needs it? Is there an extenuating circumstance that will help you? So the only thing that really tells you if you have coronavirus is the coronavirus test. That's the only thing, which is why, since we don't have enough tests, everybody's out there saying, if you have any symptoms, you assume you have it and you stay home. You could have the common cold. You might not have it. It's terrible, right? Someone else had pointed out, what if you end up going home and being quarantined for 14 days and you never had it? Sorry, that's, <laughs> that's terrible. I, I feel bad, but that's unfortunately because we have a paucity of testing right now. That's the situation we're in, and we have to make do, do those um, practices to try and protect our healthcare system. So it's terrible. Everybody's making a sacrifice right now, um, but that's where it is. There's one more thing I want to address because we mentioned this. Is this a one-time virus like the chicken box, one and done? Yes, probably, um, but with a caveat. So based on our models from SARS, we haven't looked at this one, but um, the way that SARS developed is once you did develop an immunity to it, you had that immunity for at least two years. They found that that immunity then decreased about 10 years out. Um, so you theoretically, if another SARS comes back, you get it 10 years later. Super unlikely, but for the most part, you're one and done. Now, the, what they are talking about is the second strain. Oh my God, freak out. Um, we don't know what the second strain is or what it's going to be right now. Could it cause another infection? Possibly. Um, this is what the cold viruses like to do. They mutate and they come back every year, which is why you get a flu every year, which is why you get a, a cold every year. So um, they think there's going to be some um, amount of seasonality to it. We think that the herd immunity kind of idea is going to help us with the more people develop immunity to the basic form of it. It's going to get better. Um, and we should not expect this to be recurring to this severity. We're doing this to slow it down. And in a few months, we should be mostly recovered. And people might get a little bit ill, but right now we don't expect a full uh, repeat uh, infection. And thanks, Igor. I was wondering when he was going to get on here and start trolling us. I knew it was only a matter of time. We do love yeah. you. You've helped us out a lot. He's the smart one out of the three of us, frankly. So, yeah. um, Just playing off that point, though, um, one thing that I was reading about and I mentioned, again, Please don't panic when you hear this, but um, we talk about just coronavirus in general. Um, there are like three or four endemic coronaviruses just in the U.S., but they don't cause severe symptoms. The ones that we're seeing, COVID-19 is very special in that sense, but there are two strands of it. So uh, one thing that we saw coming out of China was um, some people would get better and then they would either relapse or they're like, is it like another infection? Like, we don't know. We have a theory right now. Um, there's uh, because there's two forms of it. You might get one form of it and get infected and then recover and then get the second one. If you're not quarantine, you know, if you have symptoms, if you're not quarantining, if you don't social distance and we're seeing too one of the concerns I think there are for us for my own personal safety, one thing that I'm seeing that's concerning is so many healthcare workers are getting hit. And this kind of gets to uh, my sister's question. You know, she said there are 150 police officers that were quarantined in Detroit. What happens when all medical professionals are quarantined and infected like Italy? Do we have plans for this yet? 
Um, you know, there's been some really funny articles to me where, you know, you'll have someone who's not in our field say, oh, you know, the ER, you know, I could do their job with my eyes closed. I guarantee you they cannot. They can attempt to. But do you want someone who has not seen a stroke in 30 years trying to treat and diagnose a stroke and get you the treatment you need in time? Do you want someone who's never done an innovation and put you on a breathing machine to do that in 20? Like, you don't want that. You want an emergency physician there. You want emergency nurses. You want EMTs. You want respiratory techs. So um, one thing that we're doing is, again, the CDC in particular has changed how we ourselves get tested. And this also hits on a question I had about someone who uh, works like in a retail store. I'll get to some my thoughts on that in a sec. Um, but for us, um, the biggest thing we can do, you got to get your representatives and senators to get us the protection we need. I do not want to go to work if I don't have appropriate protective equipment because I don't want to get exposed. They're seeing if you get a double exposure or continuous exposure, it's just increasing your risk of poor outcomes. And we don't know why. And we don't have great data on it. So we don't know what's going on. But we're considered in the highest risk pool of like seeing these people um, outside of people who are otherwise like if you take a, a, another 32 year old who does not work in an ER, they're probably fine. They're considered low risk. I'm considered high risk because all I do is see sick people all day. That's it. I go in for 12 hours a day. People are coughing everywhere. They're not covering it. They're not following the advice that we're trying to get out to you guys. Um, so. If you're out in public, like let's say you work in a grocery store, and this is a great question for those who work in it. I've thought about this. I don't have a great explanation for you um, because one of my issues is that younger people in this country aren't seeing this as an issue. I know there's some people who are older than us that don't either, but it is an issue because it gets back to flattening that curve instead of getting these big peaks we are going to get hit in our ER. And this goes back to what I was saying before. You're going to be at home watching Netflix, making your TikTok, reading, doing whatever you're doing. We are in the battlefronts dealing with this. I mean, it is chaos out there. So if you're in a, a retail shop, some things you can do. If, like we said before, you're not going to have a hospital grade mask. Anything that you know can like go over, if you have a symptoms, if someone else does, you know, try and get something to protect yourself as much as possible. It's not great, but it's better than absolutely nothing. If someone's going to use a credit card, try not to touch the credit card. You know, you can wear gloves if you're handling food items. Um, but again, if you're not changing gloves in between every time you're seeing someone, you don't really know, or each piece of fruit, you don't know if someone else has touched it. We don't know how long it lasts on surface. So if you're going to consume those products, wash your hands, wash your fruits, general hygiene. Um, but, you know, making sure you're washing your hands uh, as best as possible in between customers, if there's anything touching it. And then when you go home to consume those products, again, general hygiene, general things, it's not magic. I'm trying to, someone's like, oh, no, there's got to be some magic here. I'm telling you, it's not. It's generalized precautions done by 350 million people that makes the biggest difference on these things. All right, Mark. All you, my man. <laughs> so my friend Phil is asking about, or talking about, do the people that get really sick get pneumonia? So this actually is a good caveat into what Kevin's saying. So this kind of disease process is actually very familiar to people like me who are interested in critical care. So those of you who don't know, I'm trying, hopefully trying to do, I'll go off and do some more critical care and stuff like that. So when you get some of these infections, especially viral infections, as we know, there's no good treatment for it. The antibiotics don't help. What typically happens is you get an infection down in the lower part of your lungs. That leads to a cytokine um, cascade or essentially a globalized septic response. Your whole body goes into inflammation. And that issue, that, that then causes uh, damage, irritation, and then fibrosis in your lungs. So that system, that process is well known. We've dealt with a lot. And that appears to be the process that you go into um, when you get a severe coronavirus infection. Um, what happens after that is all you know, kind of a disease process in luck, right? So we know that it causes that ARDS, it causes fluid buildup in your lungs. And then from there, then you get essentially get put on a ventilator, you get put on support to try and help your lungs rest and relax and try to help them heal. During that process, you're more likely to be susceptible to things like pneumonias and other infections. 
but it's not a super infection. So specifically with our influenza, one of the things we see is that if you get the flu, the people that tend to get more severe and die from the flu, it's usually because you get a staph infection in your lungs that causes super infection. Um, that's not necessarily true with coronavirus as far as I've seen. Um, I haven't heard that data. Can someone can correct me? But my understanding is it basically leads to ARDS or basically a localized uh, immune reaction and um, uh, um, overwhelming. What's the thing? word I'm looking for? Not sepsis, but... Um, uh, inflammation, globalizing, uh, global inflammation reaction in the body. And that inflammation leads to sepsis, leads to damage to the lungs, and that's why you're critically ill. And then the only thing you do, once it happens, it's the body's own process. There's nothing to treat. It's just waiting for your body to heal, which is why these are scary scenarios and why these are difficult things to treat, because it's just waiting for the body to heal, and everybody heals a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a question that popped up from uh, Phil. Thanks for the comment, by the way. Much appreciated. Uh, and thanks for watching. Um, he asked, so uh, the people who are dying, are they getting pneumonia oh, and the normal it. antibiotics that treat them? Did you just answer that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. I was listening, but I was also looking at some other stuff. Um, and then Courtney asked, should we listen to uh, the White House press briefing or some of these other doctors? Who is the most credible? Um, I will tell you, I don't want to answer that because um, there's a lot of politics involved. Um, I'm trying to avoid that. Um, credible sources um, that we use are mostly the CDC in general um, and also peer-reviewed journals. Um, but if you don't have background in peer-reviewed journals, um, you know, uh, I, really, I mean, we're trying to give you the, the information um, and explain uh, from where we're coming from and clarify what that information means. Um, and that's why we created this, uh, you know, this Facebook Live event for you. Outside of that, um, any of the major groups like um, the American Heart Association, um, the Association for Infectious Disease, some of these national groups that have guidelines that specifically tell you what it is, those are the ones I would use. I don't want to, I, I don't really, you know, know what's coming from the White House. I don't want to comment on it because I don't know and I haven't seen it. Um, but, uh, you know, your local primary doctor, your gynecologist, your pediatrician, your surgeon, they're watching all these issues and they are experts in their field. Um, the same way that we are experts at resuscitation and critical management and emergency care, we can give you a perspective on that. So if you have specific questions on those fields, you need to ask the people that know you the best, that know your chronic medical conditions the best, and that see it every day. Um, and I, I trust them. Like, None of us are out here trying to give you bad information. We're trying to get you educated and get you on the same page that we are because we want you to be healthy. We want you to do well. We want to overcome this as a country and basically throughout the world. So um, those things, um, please talk to your, your primary doctor, get more information. And if you have concerns, ask them. All right. I have run into, I recently read an article by, um, a specialist, I think he was an intensivist as well, uh, was on the Facebook group and he mentioned that when they've been looking at, they found that unfortunately the WHO has been somewhat unreliable, but one of the better, um, he's getting the eyebrow looks, um, one, of the better, uh, one of the better sites is actually from Johns Hopkins. Um, they've been using their own sources as trying to collect data um, as far as uh, the world in front of infection rates and they obviously have cure rates. So the people that have been getting better, so they have um, rate of infection, rate of death, and then cure rate. So they've actually uh, been a pretty accurate and good source that I discovered today. So they might be worth uh, checking out. Yeah. Um, one of my good friends from college, Kelly, hey, um, I haven't talked to you in a while. She wants to know, uh, Kevin, how long do you think uh, or expect things to get really bad? Ooh, that is a tough question um, because we are still not social distancing like we should. People who should quarantine aren't I know people in medicine in my own field that think this is kind of just a big joke. Um, I tend to be more conservative. I have a lot of concern for other people's health and safety in general. Um, and you know, this is something unprecedented that I've talked to my parents, I've talked to relatives, you know, who are much older than me, who have gone through like the, you know, different periods in our time no one has seen anything like this. And I think if you can't see that world economies are being shut down and travel is being suspended, there's a reason. And it's because we are so concerned about this. 
So I, in, and this is just my opinion, I think in the next one to three weeks for us in the ER and in all of medicine, it's gonna be terrible. Um, I think it's gonna be really bad for us because that's when we're gonna start seeing all of the bad cases come through. Um, you know, someone asked me on my last video, how long do I think it's going to last? That depends on how much we flatten the curve and stop this spike in um, people getting infected. There are ultra conservative um, things that say August. I don't necessarily think it's going to be August. I don't think it's going to be just a couple more days of this. You know, um, I know schools have shut down, I think at least until like mid April. Some say, oh, maybe May. In my personal opinion, depending on what we see, I don't see life kind of going back to normal for a couple of weeks at least. And that's if we can control this thing. If we don't do these things that we are stressing about preventing you even getting it, it can be a long time. You know, we can't stop people from going outside. You can't force it unless if you do something drastic like a martial law. But if you look at Italy, you know, someone was like, oh, Italy's like doing better today. Like, you know, you know, there's reports of China doing better. We don't have all the data from China. And Italy went from like 750 deaths yesterday down to 651. That's a lot of people that just died. So they're not doing great, you know? And they're about 10 days, uh, what our, our models are showing, they're about 10 days ahead of us. In 10 days from now, I am very nervous when I go into work because it's gonna be chaos. We're gonna have a lot of people infected, a lot of people sick, and we need these resources. We need people, again, to help us prepare for this and do your part. I'm on day nine of quarantine. If I can do it, you guys can do it. I'm I'm an ER physician. I want to be out. I want to be on the front lines, but I'm doing my part, and I hope you guys can too, all right? So honestly, I think the next couple of weeks will say a lot. At worst, and I doubt it, I, I think worst case is August that it could be like this. Um, yeah, I've had, and somebody else asked, this is a good one I want to touch on. Someone said, so do you think that all you need to go to the grocery store is masks and, and gloves? So I'd say, actually, no. So this is what we talked about. Um, if you are asymptomatic and um, don't really have any significant um, uh, exposure to the virus, then masks and gloves are not going to be helpful to you. Uh, you don't need them. You just need the social distancing. And frankly, we need those uh, in the hospitals and on the front lines and in the emergency department. That's why we've been requesting people not to buy them, wear them and use them because we need them and we are running out of them in the hospital. So it doesn't help you. Um, it doesn't, the, the mask on you doesn't prevent you from getting it. That's what we talked about, right? The only thing that helps you from getting it is the N95s. When the N95s are running out of the hospital, we're going to be actively taking care of people that are in our face and having it, intubating being next to someone's face, when they have it, that's when I need an N95, right? So, and then if you have coronavirus, then you need to be self-quarantined. Those masks and the, those everything doesn't necessarily prevent you from spreading it to other people and not in a significant enough way. So you don't need to wear gloves and a mask out. It doesn't really help anything. And in fact, you're hurting me and I hate, I'm just kidding, it's fine, but please don't do it. It doesn't actually help, so. <laughs> Um, one of my favorite questions too, um, <laughs> uh, can you see someone if you're dating them? Uh, this is great. Uh, <laughs> if it's Kevin, absolutely not. You shouldn't, nobody should date Kevin. They should know better. Yeah. So I call this the, uh, the Corona crush question. Um, so you got someone during the, the coronavirus epidemic or pandemic. Um, and, uh, look, I, we are not here to judge. We are here to give information that is on your daily life. Um, so I guess my question to you is, you know, um, a lot of people who are younger, um, they either have roommates, um, a lot of people live by themselves. The scenario is kind of different. Um, and it depends on who you work with. And someone I think asked me like, you know, their, uh, their partner um, or spouse or whoever it was, they were um, like an ICU nurse, I think. Um, but the question is, you know, how do we stop this thing from spreading? So if you are in a like a new relationship, I guess my question to you is how many people are you interacting with? Um, because if both of you only, like you both work from home right now because of you know everything being shut down, 
you are social distancing, you know, you know, social distancing, by the way, you can still see people, you can still, you know, you know, interact with them, but from a distance, you know, that's six feet. Like we have that set up in our ERs and tents, like people sit away from each other, you know, don't go to the pool and have like 30 people around you. I mean, socially distance yourself. Um, elevators are a bad spot to be in. Cause like, I can't go in my elevator right now safely for my own concern for other people. Um, but if you're going to be dating someone, you guys need to make sure that, you know, it just takes one person interacting with like three others. And then you see it spread and spread and spread and it becomes this exponential sequence. Um, if you guys are by yourself and you've made a commitment to only see like one other person, that's typically fine. Now, the question too is what if you live with someone, you know, that doesn't mean you need to stop like, you know, interacting with them, have your relationship, you know, especially if you're living together, um, you shouldn't stop that. You should stop if someone gets symptoms um, and do your best. You know, not everyone has two bedrooms or two bathrooms, but try to keep each other, you know, just safe. Wash your hands regularly. If you're the sick person, you know, try and use a different bathroom or sleep in a different bed. Um, unless if you're trying to be nice to them, they can have the nice bed. Um, use a different bathroom, you know, like those things, um, they, they're they small things, somewhat, depending on your relationship. They're small things, but they make a big difference. And I'm not gonna be able to tell you if you ask me through like a Facebook message, if you have it or not, if you've been tested. And even if you've been tested, you need two tests at least 24 hours apart to confirm it. And even then that's not hundred percent. So if you have these symptoms, if you have concerns, if there's someone that you have your crush on that you just started dating, you know, it's okay to see those person, uh, those people, but be wary of anyone else that you're interacting with. And if you have symptoms, you need to stop altogether. All right. Until these symptoms resolve and you're three days free of the symptoms after at least a week. All right. So I don't want to stop everyone's love lives. But just be, you know, I, I want you to be aware of the things that can potentially happen with that. All right. You guys saw it out here first. Dr. Kamel giving out relationship advice. And next, next Dr. <laughs> Drew in the not making. Really, no. Not relationship <laughs> advice. Dr. Drew just in the making. All right. <laughs> relationship advice. I like it. So we're, uh, we're at like an hour and 16 minutes. I think, um, you know, I don't have too many other points. Mark, did you have anything major you want to hit on? Any other big questions you're saying? No, I think that's the, the big things we kind of talked about is, um, you know, what's the difference? What do you really need to do with social distancing and when you need to quarantine? I think those are the things we have to talk about. What do you actually need to do for quarantine? Um, is there um, treatment and testing out there and how available is it? Which is kind of like we're still figuring it out. And, um, and then the other basic things about it, I think that's mostly what we talked about. And then, you know, stay home. Um, what to expect if you come to the emergency department, which is we're probably going to be overwhelmed. Um, people, a lot of people don't understand it's not an urgent care, it's not a doctor's office. We treat everybody um, based on the severity and um, uh, triage you based on severity and how acute it is. And it takes time and things take a lot of time um, to get done properly. So um, be patient with us if you do end up there. And then, yeah, do the things you can to be safe, be mindful. You guys are sparing us, help us out. Um, don't use all the masks and gloves. They don't help. Save them for us so that we can take better care of you. Yeah. Um, one final thing I want to talk about, and we have said this multiple times to reinforce this. Um, the biggest thing with this is prevention. Um, there are multiple types of prevention. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention that we look at um, when it comes to things like pandemics. So you have a primary prevention that is trying to stop you from getting the disease. That is our biggest thing. And the biggest thing you can do at home is to stop uh, getting close to people. This is social distancing at its finest. There's also secondary prevention. And that means you just got coronavirus, but how to stop it from getting worse? That's quarantining yourself. You have symptoms, you have it now quarantine yourself. And then there's tertiary, and that is for someone trying to reduce the symptoms you have. Um, and this is, uh, I'm looking at more like the severe forms and what the treatments are. Again, our treatments are limited. There's no magic cure for this, no elderberry. There's no magic drug we've developed. Plaquenil is still early. The treatments we have are to take care of your breathing and put you on a breathing machine if it's bad. 
to treat your blood pressure if it's low or too high, to work on your kidney function. If you do have a bacterial infection, we give you antibiotics. And then you just got to get, you know, it depends on your risk factors, what your age is. And again, we're seeing data that's showing that almost every age can get hit by this. Above 10, there are definitely, you know, fatalities in young kids, unfortunately, people we have no idea risk factors for. So we want to get primary prevention, socially distance, and then quarantine as much as possible so that we're not doing these experimental therapies on your life. We want you to be safe. We want you to be healthy. And we want to answer your practical questions. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, we may do some more videos you know, in the future. I'm on TikTok with entertaining videos. You can look me up. I'm Corona Kamel. I'm also on uh, Instagram at Pharaoh Kevy Kev, and that's F A I R O H Kevy Kev. If you want to follow me, we try and keep it light on there too, but answer your day to day questions and keep you updated here. Mark, do you have anything you want to close with? No, I think, again, anybody that tuned in, I appreciate you being here because this is significant information. Um, don't look at us as trying to spread it. We're trying to spread information. If you have an opportunity, or somebody wants to know, um, please forward this them, uh, this them, this video, um, so that they can be informed. Everything is about knowledge, and knowledge is power, right? So, the more we can increase it, the more powerful we are. Um, we really appreciate you being here because we put in time trying to research this stuff and making sure that we know as much as we can to be informed and to inform you. I get to put my own plug in there, so follow my Instagram, uh, Doctor Wise Guy, if you haven't already. I try to keep things a little bit more light there too. I have some ideas that I'm going to do for TikTok with Kevin because he's been bugging me about it because he's quarantined. There's nothing better to do. And frankly, we might as well have some fun while we can. Um, <laughs> I have a couple ideas for YouTube videos. I'm trying to start a channel because I think there's some important things to talk about. I have some ideas going forward. So keep an eye out, you know, different things, other minor um, topics. And if there's any topics or anything that you guys want to know about what it's like to be an ER physician, about things we deal with, you know, that stuff we can address in the future. I don't know if we'll do another live. We'll see if there's demand. If you guys want us to, as we update it, we can. Um, but otherwise, there's definitely going to be um, things and stuff to talk about. So um, we love you guys. I've been my friends and family that are there. So happy to see you here. Um, I'm glad you could, you could join us. All right. Thanks, Mark. Much appreciated. Thank you for joining me. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Love you all. Yes. <laughs>